I'm going to start and uh, I'm gonna, uh, I, I'd like to welcome you, uh, my colleagues. I'm really happy and excited to be uh, listening to you talk about one of the initiatives that the Center for Humanities is happy to support with the graduate school. I wanna thank Molly Rogers and Kyla Bowen for um, helping us organize these events. And I'll introduce these, the two groups which are collaborative working groups in the humanities writ large uh, very briefly. And we are doing this to get give you a chance to talk about your experiences in running these groups. Uh, having run the humanities labs that have been funded by Georgette Bennett in honor of uh, Leonard Polanski. So these are called Polanski grants. So we're very grateful for the funding and we use this as a resource for future faculty groups who wanna constitute themselves around a certain topic that isn't really captured or represented in the way the institution is currently organized. Um, I'll introduce the two groups. The first group is the Asylum uh, Humanities Lab group. Um, and the three people in that group, are Peter Musavi, Benjamin Schmidt and Brian Zengod Willits. Uh, Peter is a PhD candidate in history in Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at NYU and studies the material politics of land, water, and subsoil struggles in 20th century Iran. Her research has been supported by various um, grants from the American Institute of Iranian Studies and the Social Science Research Council. And she has been volunteering to help people petition for asylum since 2019. And we're really interested, Peter, in hearing kind of your work that's both scholarly and applied in the world or activist. Uh, ben Schmidt is clinical associate professor in the Department of History in the Faculty of Arts and Science at NYU and director of the Digital Humanities at NYU. His current historical project, Creating Data, explores data collected in the 19th century American state through archival research, visualization, and interactive publication. Uh, ben has also written on higher education, the uh, crisis of the humanities, which seems to come back like a perpetual wave that recedes and returns, and digital humanities. Um, and Brian Zengo Willits is a PhD candidate at NYU studying the United States and the world during the long 19th century, uh, especially on immigration, global migrations, and imperialism. He's worked in education and exhibitions department at major museums and holds a certificate in public history from NYU. Uh, he's also the digital and public communications coordinator for the Immigration and Ethnic, Ethnic History Society. So maybe you can talk about those roles in addition to your academic role as well. And then the second group uh, is Ryan and Leaf Digital Theory HLAB group. It's our longest running group in the Humanities Lab, actually. So we really appreciate that you're here to share your experiences. Ryan Healy is a doctoral candidate in the English department in the Faculty of Arts and Science and a founding member of the Digital Theory Lab at NYU. His research revolves around the history of abstraction from the 18th century to convolutional neural networks. And his writing has appeared in various journals, including Representations, New Inquiry, Book Forum, and LA Review of Books. And Lee Weatherby is actually my colleague in the Department of German, among other things, Associate Professor of German and Founding Directors of the Digital Theory Lab at NYU. He writes about digital technologies, political economy, German romanticism, idealism, which are all somehow connected as he's shown. <laughs> His writings have appeared in Critical Inquiry, New German Critique, LA Review Books, and other journals. And his work has been supported uh, by an NEH grant and the Humboldt Foundation. So we'll start with the Asylum H Lab group, uh, then the Digital Theory group. I'm gonna get off screen. And we really appreciate you having a conversation that is gonna share the experiences. This is being recorded for other faculty, as I said before, who can take some of the the positive things, the things you hadn't expected maybe to happen, and then the things also that didn't quite work and we can help you with. And the point of this is really for us to learn from your experiences. And I can add one thing for Molly and Kyla and me, it's also really, really fantastic to always hear about your work and we get to know the incredibly wide range of humanities work that done at NYU in so many different departments. So we really appreciate this opportunity. So I'm gonna disappear from the screen, but I'll be present and listening and we look forward to your presentations. All right, hello everybody. Um, so I'm here talking on behalf of the Asylum Lab, which is one of these H labs that was started with this uh, Ben Polonsky support in our case in the fall of 2020. Um, 
And we're going to be talking today about the directions that that research has taken. Um, and I want to sort of start off by explaining what the original conception of this lab was, which was that the idea was that we would be able to merge a set of concerns about advocacy and record keeping and public history uh, in a way that could respond to the crisis around immigration and uh, the breakdown of the asylum system and the legal processes intended to protect asylum seekers, especially under the Trump administration, but in a, in a deeper sense going back um, in some ways, I think I thought 20 years when we began this lab, but I come to see as we were reading it, uh, basically since the introduction of the concept of asylum at all. What's especially interesting about asylum is that the way that the immigration bureaucracy works in the United States is that it sort of lives on stories. It requires stories to exist, to adjudicate whether someone belongs in the United States, but then it warps those stories to fit into a legal framework. It hides the stories and it classifies the stories. And in many cases, it ultimately destroys them before they get out. And that question of how useful these stories are outside of the state purposes for which they were created is the thing that sort of drove our lab from the beginning. As we've gotten going more and more, we focused especially on one particular type of source called A-files, which are the complete dossier maintained by first uh, Immigration Naturalization Services and then um, United States Customs and Immigration Services since the, since the early 2000s. Um, which contain a full record of the interactions of, a, of an alien with the immigration bureaucracy and exist for almost everybody who comes into the United States. And they're full of not just the sort of formulaic, like, you know, check a box off, do something that you could do quantitative social science with, which is about the only way that a lot of these immigration records are used, but also uh, personal affidavits, records, people telling stories about the first time that they met individuals, and not just records about the United States, but records that speak to all of the different parts of the world that people come from, which uh, by the nature of asylum are things that are places that uh, are sort of especially in turmoil. And what um, has been especially interesting about working in a lab which is focused on a particular type of document, a particular type of source, as opposed to trying to adopt a subject or a methodology, is it's meant that our real goal here is to figure out how to unlock all of the various different uses that these kinds of sources can have for all of the different constituencies that use them, which means not just you know, people like me who are interested in understanding state record keeping, um, but all of the other different sorts of researchers out there. And so when we brought uh, our group together, my co-directors, Ellen Noonan and Zabilla Fisher and I for that lab all come from different backgrounds. Um, Zabilla more from a literary studies background, Ellen from a public history background and I from digital humanities. And the graduate students that we've been working with also bring those sort of complementary backgrounds, both in terms of their, um, their academic interests. Bita, who you'll be hearing from first is a, um, has a background in Iranian history and is much more interested not in in the history of the United States, but in some of the ways that we might be able to tell about the rest of the world from the, their, their view from the immigration bureaucracy. And Brian coming in with uh, a much deeper knowledge of immigration history than any of us had beginning. But also because this is such a public humanities project, um, they bring expertise and interest in like they're, I don't want to say extracurricular, but in the different types of interests that they bring, which really alluded to at the beginning, that um, that Beta has deeper connections with the activist side of things, which has always been an important part of our our group and our goals for what can happen with these documents, and that uh, led her to be one of our major point people as we set up a conversation with a number of these different activist groups at the end of last year. Uh, and Brian, who has all of this experience with public history and working in museums and thinking about how to bring various different uh, constituencies into talking about that. And from my point of view, it's been especially interesting because we get to like really dig into kind of technical historical details into sources, which are not just the A files themselves, but things like the records disposition authorities that the National Archives puts in place, which are 
when you're working collaboratively can be really dull stuff to look at, but also can be a really uh, nice way to farm out materials across lots of people. We had a bunch of times where we like divided up the federal register into a bunch of different groups and tried to figure out exactly what was going on legally and what some of the legal loopholes were uh, that, that BETA used to pull things. Um, what comes through FOIA as opposed to under other mechanisms. And also things like where these things are stored. Um, there's, a, there's a whole shaggy dog story, which I won't tell now about the strange underground caves in Kansas City where, where most A files are actually uh, held nowadays. Um, the last thing I wanna say though, is that there are also, when you're working with these sorts of documents, just because they're important, um, they are also ethically incredibly problematic. These things touch on some of the most intimate details of people's lives. We're encountering medical records. We're encountering um, things like the um, wedding photographs of this woman, Marilyn Rodriguez, who we don't know anything about except that be to determine that she was dead and pulled her A file. Um, and you get, you know, pictures of her getting married with her husband carefully uh, 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 redacted out of this picture, but again and again, we found information that shouldn't have been in the public domain that we were encountering. And that led us to really change our vision of what we were gonna be doing with this lab as we as we went into it. And I found, and I think that Ellen Zabilla found too, that one of the ways that uh, having a large group working on these things was that it helped to keep us ethically grounded in the sorts of questions that we were asking, the sorts of approaches that we were going to make, because we had a lot of different people who were able to raise red flags about what might be problematic or harmful uses of the sorts of records that we were looking at. Um, and that, um, that, that attitude towards research as something which has an impact on all the various different communities that it, that it touches on uh, was really uh, important and useful to the way that this lab has evolved. That's probably too much from me. Uh, Bita, let me ask you to talk. Um, so as Ben's already sort of said, the specific interest and expertise of our lab members differed, um, but our work was united by a fundamental recognition of the fact that government bureaucracies are of course prolific producers of documents. Um, and by curiosity to know essentially what happens to these documents, what happens to the many, many thousands of pages of documents the government produces um, related to asylum and immigration. So I worked with the lab along with um, another former research assistant, Benjamin, to really just FOIA a bunch of these more recent A files. Um, and my interest in the lab was an outgrowth of um, my work as has been alluded to, um, helping people file for asylum. And in particular, I did a lot of that with the New Sanctuary Coalition, a pro se clinic. Um, that is today unfortunately shuttered, but which for many years ran out of Judson Memorial Church, um, partnering asylum seekers with translators, note takers, and volunteers to help them secure legal relief from deportation. So my time with NSC and other volunteer run legal clinics gave proof to two of the lab's concerns about immigration records, which is while one, how government agencies, legal representatives, and advocacy groups keep records is unclear. What is clear is that Second, access to government records is highly differentiated. Advocates, lawyers, and asylum seekers are often forced to go through a cumbersome process of requesting government files through the Freedom of Information Act, while, of course, uh, ICE and related agencies do not. Uh, so FOIAing recent, recent A files was done in part to accomplish three things. One, to test available public access methods for requesting A files. Two, to provide a more recent and geographically diverse supplement to the A files. Uh, used to develop the website that Brian is going to show us, hopefully in a bit, and three to begin to assess patterns of what's included and what's redacted in released records. Um, something that, you know, as, as Ben mentioned, is can be rather arbitrary. And so while FOIA records is itself not particularly exciting work, it did require us, the members of the lab, to think and work collaboratively, not just among ourselves, but with genealogists and government officials. One of the immediate problems we encountered in our efforts was the problem of bureaucratic confusion. We knew from work that Brian had done that NARA does not house recent A-files, their collection ends in 1918. So A-files to begin with are not accessible through archives but FOIA requests. And speaking with a former MA public archive student and current genealogist, Alec Ferretti, we learned that USCIS holds A-files before they're deposited to NARA, um, that we would be best off using their specific FOIA portal to submit these requests and that we would need to submit along with our request proof of the individual's death. 
So navigating this bureaucratic patchwork revealed a few things about how the state manages immigration records and ultimately deposits them um, to national archives. For one, researching USCIS's digitization capabilities revealed that the agency has already spent a massive amount of money, $150 million to be exact, a huge amount when you think that Google has spent $600 million digitizing some 25 million books to contract firms to scan eight files. Our research also put us in conversation with a former USCIS historian who confirmed that despite USCIS's legal obligation to transfer digital deposits every five years, transfers to NARA have not been forthcoming. To this point, not a single digital deposit has been made. The people we spoke to at NARA do not seem to understand what is happening within USCIS and vice versa. So the overall transition to digital record keeping and electronic internal communication has not translated into a dem democratization of access for immigrants, historian advocates, or the overall public. The same USCIS or former USCIS historian described digging through office trash cans for email printouts and other documents to preserve because no protocol, protocols had yet been put in place to preserve internal agency communications under this new digital regime. So certain records are now more, not less likely to be lost, destroyed, or mismanaged in the absence of a clear system of digital record keeping and archiving. This confusion had a parallel in the responsive records that we did receive, which were littered with redactions, but also the release of sensitive information and so on. But a question worth asking is, you know, why is the lab interested in A-files anyway? How did we move from asylum to this particular genre of documents? Um, and what position are we in to mend the sort of broken information ecology I've just described? So while, uh, we initially imagined that from you know, the perspective of advocates and asylum seekers, aggregating and enabling digital queries on recent A-files could meet really clear needs, uh, allowing advocates to search uh, for how applicants from a particular village, Goro, like the one mentioned in um, this tran court transcript, come from. Um, we learned that the road to academic advocate collaboration still has a long way to go. Distrust, we learned from one advocate working with Ukrainian and Russian speaking immigrants, pervades not just the relationship between immigrants, asylum seekers, and the government, but even immigrants and community advocates, to the point that many asylum seekers are reluctant to share paper records um, with their own legal representatives and advocates. So, Clearly the interests and duties of legal representatives of advocacy groups and of historians drastically diverge. All want different things out of these documents and very often the order, order, order of the day is not preservation or publicization, but privacy and protection. So while the social historian could in theory build all sorts of arguments out of information in A files related to individuals' occupations, incomes, savings, and so on, uh, for legal representatives, an ethical obligation exists to keep this information undisclosed. Um, and here's an example of, of I think, a, a document that a, the social historian could, could use to many ends, uh, not just a social historian even, and what it is is a original on the right um, birth certificate from a man, Umberto Quezada from the Dominican Republic on, on the left English translation. And you get a sense of some of the racial categories um, internal to the Dominican Republic that are used to describe its citizens. So while the lab is now imagining how uh, we might collabor collaborate with advocacy groups and migrants to create a guide to, FOIA, to the FOIA process so that they could request their own A files, um, as I did mine. Here you can see two little excerpts from it. Um, as well as the creation of a larger community archive, which would store individuals' files if they chose only to volunteer them. Um, there are essentially still many questions we'll need to ask ourselves before we get there. Like, how do we create safeguards to ethically steward these records? Um, and would that even allow us to overcome some of the distrust that I've described? Um, and does the lab's ambition to enlarge our collection of A files in any way run potentially counter to the particular and peculiar specificity of A files that makes them so enthralling, reproducing the same tendencies of our administrative state to reduce individual lives to data points. So those are some of the questions I think that we're currently mulling over um, and that we will continue to have to until we're able to make some of these connections with um, and collaborations, not just among ourselves, but with you know um, different constituencies. So. Yeah, that's it for me. And I hope that Brian is able to take you guys to an earlier phase of the, the, the lab and show you some of the other work that we've been up to. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bita. Do you hear me now? Yes. 
Yay. Okay. Yeah. Of course, it worked in the beginning when uh, it didn't matter, and then not when it was supposed to. But okay, great. Uh, thanks, Bita. Thanks, Ben. And thanks, everyone, for being here and uh, for hosting this event. So uh, there's my, uh, that should be, let's see. Okay, are you seeing my screen too? Hearing me and seeing my screen? Okay, great, so it's all working. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of gonna go back in time a little bit and kind of walk you through my involvement in the HLAB um, and what ultimately culminated in uh, a digital public history project that we were trying to figure out, you know, what what it could be, and it, it we have ultimately devised something of a, a prototype that's not necessarily complete, but it's at least um, been informative in terms of our thinking on what we might do with these types of records. And you know, really from my vantage point, um, being involved from the very beginning, the first stage where we really just did research before. Uh, even planning our class or figuring out what the project was. It was a highly interdisciplinary um, collaborative uh, approach. And, you know, I began in 2019 and, and we had graduate students and faculty coming from history and Spanish and Portuguese departments. Um, and with our departmental advisors uh, or divisions, you know, everyone had their own particular areas of specialty. So at the outset, we cast this really wide net as we explored all these different contemporary moments and uh, especially in asylum in, the, in this system alongside the, the possible directions that we could take with our spring class and any potential public facing work that we might engage in. So we studied scholarship on migration, both in the history and in literature fields, looked at digital public history projects, interviewed migration lawyers, activists, journalists, um, and you know, looking back on it all, that semester of research was really pretty bold. and. It was highly collaborative endeavor that to my mind un really unquestionably shaped the direction that we took our class in in the spring that followed and and um, also that shaped the kind of results of this digital uh, history project here and, and the work that we're continuing to explore. So that research from that first semester led to a slightly more focused class that has been explained really zoomed into the contemporary moment in immigration policy, but especially as it pertained to asylum. Um, we have a core class that met every week that was taught primarily by the three faculty who were in the class. And there's a practicum, one of which I taught um, along with the other graduate students in the lab. So it was in this phase that I really benefited from the co-teaching uh, of the course with three faculty members uh, because I had had some experience in teaching at that point, but hadn't really taught my specialty uh, at, at the university level, which is, has been mentioned, U.S. immigration history in the late 19th and early 20th century. So I certainly hadn't combined that with teaching a practicum either that would give undergraduate students some kind of grounding in building a digital public history project that, um, you know, I was really a neophyte. And when it uh, came to the digital aptitudes that I would need to pull off building this collaborative project with my undergraduate students, um, I, you know, I really had no clue going into it. Um, the reality is I, I couldn't have done it if I didn't have the support and the guidance of the, the HLAB faculty who were there, who really helped me in a great deal in developing my own technical skills, um, which we then were able to pass on to the students. So we, we collaborated on the pedagogical elements too, that kind of trickled down from, you know, faculty with experience to graduate students who are working towards this goal. And then of course the undergrads. Um, and, you know, my practicum co-teacher, Alexia Orenko Green, who's not with us here today, but um, was instrumental in that class too. Um, you know, we, we had to sync up our teaching with the core class at the same time. So I was able to really learn and grow from this collaboration with the faculty in a, in a environment that's pretty unusual in the humanities, one that most of my colleagues would, would have had and cohort would have had really no idea what, what, what this structure was all about. And similarly for the students who took the class, they were in a very unusual and unique um, structure class that, that they all really seemed to um, benefit from. Um, so the project then we built um, th this, this project as a class with our undergrads using these A files that we've been talking about, but especially ones that were uh, from about a hundred years ago. Um, and thanks to the H lab and to the funding that we had, I was able to um, continue working on the site following the class. We weren't able to realize it fully in the time that we had in the semester. And uh, I joined the digital humanities fellows who work over the summer on various projects and, and have support from other places in the university. So um, because of the H lab, I was able to, to be a, take a part in that to continue to develop our, our work out. And then the undergraduates joined me as well. Two of our uh, star undergrads uh, helped and I continued to manage them in, in the building and development of the site. So I just wanna give you a kind of a quick overview of, of what this site is and, and what it does. Um, you know, it's, 
it takes this collection of A files that come from the National Archives website. And each one of these that you see is a document within an A file. Uh, there are 92 A files total that you can get from uh, the National Archives website. Uh, that's, you know, 0.002% uh, of, of something that they have that you can actually see in, in physical form. Um, I broke it down instead of being on the file level uh, to the to the document level. So if you want to see what this particular document is about, you get a closer view of it. You know, this kind of typical image viewer that we're all familiar with. Um, and then this is this metadata that the undergraduates and I uh, designed and then assigned to each uh, individual document all the way through. So something like two and a half thousand documents or something like that. Um, but as the class projects, uh, the students designed their own metadata schema first to apply to these images. Um, and then they broke them down and reorganized them and thought about them in analytical ways like you would with a final semester project. So each student then, instead of handing in a paper, you know, wrote an analytical piece that was meant to be hosted on a site. And they each came up with, you know, what otherwise would have been an essay that maybe they would have tossed at the end of the semester or whatever. They actually built a page that that is then hosted on the site that drew on the collection that they themselves processed and built out. Um, and we have also then begun to um, solicit more expert um, analysis of a lot of these documents and are thinking about expanding it in this direction of having people who work in specific areas um, work with the collection that we have and kind of build these kinds of um, digital exhibition pages. Um, and, you know, it has some other basic features that we can still do a lot with, um, that we just have to kind of add a few elements of code to make work a little bit differently. But one of the key features is that if you wanted to go through these files individually, they're really hard to work with, you know, but if you're looking for one particular thing that repeats in one A file to the next, like a specific form, say, or just the photographs that show up in these, you'd have to crack open each individual folder, look for it page by page. But if we do this digitally, that's one of the benefits. Um, this is running a little slow here, but uh, we can then sort through them as we've identified them this way. That could make what is otherwise a very kind of thorny and difficult um, genre of document for immigration historians who largely don't use these files and, and have not used them, um, can, could potentially make them more accessible. But uh, we have to involve new technologies and new methods of, of sorting those documents and thinking about how we would build that out. Um, all of which we basically learned and, and um, thought through in building this collaborative project, both with faculty as researchers and, and then with our undergraduate students as well. So it's served a, a pedagogical as well as a research um, uh, purpose anyways. Um, but yeah, that's about all I have. Great, so maybe we can go on with um, digital theory group and then yeah, is that okay? Yeah, great. Thank you, Uli. Um, so the Digital Theory Lab began in the fall of 2018, and uh, uh, it has, I mean, it has a it has a number of founding members and a lot of new members since then uh, in the last four, four to five years. And uh, it began as an endeavor, all, all of us were working basically in one way or another on the history and the theory of digital technologies, and we wanted to let that history and the the theoretical frameworks that led to the development of techno of digital technologies come into contact with sort of the more technical side of what the theoretical humanities looks like so um, philosophy uh, literary theory semiotics um, anthropology and so on and um, I um, after all this time, we have a little something to show for ourselves in the form of the last issue of Critical Inquiry, which I co-edited with another, another member of the lab. Four of us are in here. The issue is called uh, Surplus Data. And Surplus Data is our proposal for basically a more concrete way of phrasing the condition in which we live, which used to be called big data, but which doesn't really get at the condition. It only gets at the, at the size of the data. And um, what the issue does and what we uh, is to think through problems with the existence in the world of platforms in which we live that are tied specifically to, and not everyone in the issue focuses on this, uh, the proliferation and now pretty ubiquitous use of neural nets and machine learning. So this branch of computing that really did begin in the 1940s, but sort of only moved by fits and starts until about a decade ago when it became, when it sort of just took off. And now 
you know, dictates what website you see, what advertisement you see, uh, whether your bank account, you know, whether your bank interaction is denied or not, whether you get flagged at the airport, you know, any, any, any number of, of sort of background things in your everyday life. Um, so, like I said, the lab started, I mean, we didn't, we didn't really even set out thinking that we would publish. Um, I mean, we always had it in mind, of course, but um, the lab started in 2018. And uh, by the winter, because of some enterprising graduate students in our group, Sam Kellogg and Claire uh, Song, uh, we made a connection to a philosophy postdoc who was working in the Center for Data Science on problems with AI. Um, that was Joe Lemelin, who uh, is soon going to be an assistant professor in philosophy at, um, at Stony Brook on Long Island. So Joe made this connection to CDS for us, and we we started working on on these on these then still pretty fresh, or they felt you know to us we were only starting to hear, starting to know about. Uh, about nets and machine learning so and what we ended up doing was creating over the course of about two years a collaborative network with some graduate students in the center for data science where we pulled them in and and we worked through the math which it turns out isn't all that hard and and then some of the coding that goes together with the design of these extremely opaque extremely extensive computationally uh, like data heavy uh, 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 algorithms. And over the course of that collaboration, we learned an enormous amount. And um, after we had taught, I, I taught the, the undergraduate course, the digital theory seminar, I took the digital theory seminar into a graduate format. I mean, the undergraduate version was wonderful. Then I took it into this graduate format and I held it in the Center for Data Science. And there I had a few students from the Center for Data Science who took this course, which was basically about uh, the philosophy of Gilbert Simondon, who was a significant thinker uh, in French philosophy who thought extensively about cybernetics. So we looked at cybernetics from which these nets emerged more or less, and we looked at Simondon. And, um, and incidentally, uh, in my contribution to the critical inquiry uh, um, issue, I, I had that vetted by one of the graduate students. So it was like an actual collaborative moment where I said, hey, like, let's look this through and make sure that I'm not, you know, and, and, and so on. So I think we've, we had by that point created something like a real inter interdivisional connection and a collaboration that then for us on the humanities side was really, really significant. Um, we kept studying the nets basically up until that week when everything shut down in, uh, in March at the beginning of the pandemic. And by that point, we had done a couple of other things, like we had taken the whole lab to King's College London, where we had it, where we have a collaboration with, um, with the digital humanities department there. And we had done a digital theory summer school was what we called it for about a week in London. And so we had a kind of slightly more, a bigger than NYU interscholastic and even international group. And so when we had to pivot, what we did was we went on, we went on to Zoom, and now the lab takes two separate forms. We we meet every other week here on campus with the local group, and then the international group meets about once a month or every three weeks or so. And the last time we met, and I just want to emphasize that we had on on Zoom, we had um, on the call right in the in the Zoom, we had Shanghai and Los Angeles and Ann Arbor and New York and Chicago and Sweden and London and the Czech Republic. And so we, we have this kind of amazing, oh, and Berkeley. So we have this amazing group that sort of proliferated over time. And currently we're studying uh, Alan Turing really intensively um, and making a decision now in these weeks about what we're gonna do as we continue in the fall and into next year. Um, one other thing I wanna highlight because Ryan is about to speak is that we we managed to hold on that international group since this happened after the pandemic started, a kind of prospectus, uh, what would you call it? Uh, it was a, a prospectus lab <laughs> where we, all three of the original graduate students who came with us were at the point then where they were writing their prospectus. And so we, we, uh, we had them workshop the prospectus during, the, during lab sessions and saw the fruits of having done this collaborative work together. And so this is a little bit the history of the lab. And I just want to telegraph one thing, which is that I think that f for me, 
I don't want to speak for everyone, although I, I think this might be true for others. There's no way my work would have taken the 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 turns that it has without the lab. The lab has been totally transformative in this sense. And the reason for that at a very fundamental level is that we think together. And I noticed this in one really, really sort of like uh, one one moment where it just came together for me, where we were, you know, one of these CDS students was drawing a, yet again a, a diagram of a net on the board, and we were talking about the concept of back propagation, which is an important part of the algorithm. And Cliff Siskin, who's in the English department, said, "Well, this so this part here is that's the back propagation." And I said, "Wait a minute, that I don't think so." I said, "Isn't it this?" And we both went to the board, and we just sort of worked it out. And I thought. This is a, the socialization of a process that I usually do by myself. And that is, I think, the essence of the, the lab. That's the essence for me of, of, of what happens in a lab setting in the humanities is that we're working on material together. And sometimes that takes, sometimes that goes to a publication. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just a question of getting a handle on things that we otherwise couldn't get a handle on because we set out, at least at the beginning, to make an interface between one very technical discourse and another set of technical discourses, our own in the humanities. So, um, yeah, but so I want to hear from Ryan because I, I I'm really interested to hear how how one of our star graduate students has experienced the lab for all these years, and then uh, and then hopefully we can have more of a conversation. Well, thank you, Leif. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo a lot of what you just said, Leif, which is really well put. Um, yeah, so I just want to, I'm just going to talk about like my experience because uh, it, it's kind of unique because when I came to NYU, I was kind of thrust, uh, recruited into this group by Cliff Siskin and it's become, it was one of the very first things that uh, situated me at NYU. So, I, you know, I'm now, I feel like a hoary old uh, grad student in my uh, end of my fourth year. And, but as a result of being thrust into this lab at the beginning, it's become kind of the bedrock of my entire dissertation and my research outlook. Um, and it, it was very overwhelming at first because it was so, uh, <laughs> it was kind of alien because it was so many different departments, different outlooks, different universities. Um, but over time now, it's not only become familiar, but vital for my the composition of my dissertation committee, um, just how I viewed my, uh, coursework throughout the years. Everything is filtered now through the lab, very much so. Um, and it's kind of, uh, so generally what, what the lab has been, the digital theory lab has been, at least said it really well, I can't really improve on it, but um, you know, working through the history, theory, design, and the uses of computation, uh, digital technologies, ranging from um, history, philosophy, data science, uh, media studies, did I say all this already? Anyway, um, but uh, in a way that uh, humanities people don't really um, can think about in sort of technical detail that we got into and that we like to think at least the computer scientists don't get into the historical detail that uh, we get into. So we, as a result, it's been kind of, uh, I, I feel <laughs> if I didn't have the lab, the lab has kind of made me into a weird guy in my department, my home department of English. Uh, and now I feel like if I didn't have the lab, I would have no one to talk to. And not, but I feel like I have so, such a rich, it's weird. It's, a, it's such a weird uh, situation I find myself in um, because of this lab. Um, and so one of the amazing features of this kind of humanities lab, I think, and I, I, I can't even imagine what my uh, research would be like without it is um, it's uh, as Leaf was saying uh, there's no way that the departmental disciplinary strictures of what I you traditionally think of as what an English student would do uh, English students don't work on convolutional neural networks they would not even I mean they, they kind of increasingly do but not not quite at this level um, and so I like to think that um, this is at least my aspiration, is that the dissertation I'm working on couldn't be made anywhere else or any under any other uh, conditions. And it's not merely just uh, interdisciplinary in like the, uh, what I think pejoratively is like a bit of a facile way of applying one field to another, but thinking across like a nexus of concepts um, that exceed 
or overlap the disciplines. Uh, and the highlights for the lab for me have been, um, I mean, we've had an incredible range of speakers. The, the, what I'm, the resource that I'm drawing on is the range of speakers and uh, activities and projects we've worked on, um, drawing from people, from philosophers to media studies people to data scientists. Um, one of the highlights that Leif touched on for me um, was uh, having Alfredo Canziani come in, uh, who's an assistant professor here at NYU in computer science, who works closely with Jan LeCun. Um, so he kind of knows, uh, he knows deep learning like the back of his hand. And so he sat down and taught us uh, incredibly patiently <laughs> and laboriously, uh, we who don't know, <laughs> we who forget the basic structures of linear algebra, uh, sat us down and mapped out the coding in Python of very basic uh, neural networks. But it was an incredible, uh, incredible experience that I don't know if, I don't know how to replicate it um, or the conditions. It, it's such a unique experience that we had of uh, sitting down and trying to get to the bottom of what a very common programming task is uh, that is not common at all for humanities people. Um, another highlight for me was, uh, yeah, I'm just repeating Leaf here, but uh, the London Summer School was incredible for me where we presented, we traveled to London and presented the work we were working on um, to a similar group at King's College London. Um, just was exposed to a variety of really interesting overlapping work. Um, and then, yeah, it, indispensable for me and my own research um, was the ability to, to present my proposal, my dissertation proposal in, the, in, a work, in one of the workshop, many workshops we've had um, where I got excellent, unique feedback from uh, audiences of all sorts of disciplines. It was, it, it was really tr um, trying for me actually because I had to do a very, some, what felt like a very acrobatic act of uh, talking to multiple audiences in one document in a way that usually maybe when you write uh, a dissertation proposal for English, you assume everyone knows XYZ reference or whatever in literary theory, uh, literature generally. But I, when writing this document and presenting it to the group, I had to constantly morph my, uh, the, my orientation to a more general audience uh, and a unique audience. And that's kind of, uh, I don't know, th this is all very personal, <laughs> but it's a, the story really of me, of one, how one of these labs has really cultivated something weird or maybe unique in my research and what I'm interested in, um, in a way that, yeah, it's essential to the kind of student I've become at NYU. Um, yeah, that, that's it. That's all I'll say for, for me. That's really wonderful to hear, Ryan. Before we get going, I just want to throw that in there. That's that's really wonderful to hear. Uh, I mean, thank you. I I really appreciate this. Maybe people can, you're just going to come back in and Ryan, what you said, this is actually really interesting to listen to how it allowed you to be in your department and not be in your department. Um, and I would be curious what the other people think in the other group as well. Um, because I'm very interested actually how the institution is set up to facilitate certain things and then sometimes it just doesn't quite work. This is the place where certain things work. So maybe you could all talk a little bit about, more about that. Um, it just helps us from the center to think through how everything we do is kind of like it's supposed to facilitate faculty research. We don't actually, we are not the people to define your research, you're the people doing that for us. But when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking there's this is a moment where I, where I can think outside of these categories. The one thing I didn't quite get, and maybe from the other group as well, is how your undergraduate students see all this, because they're not as kind of indoctrinated into our institutional structures. They just have to sign up for departments and majors and all that, but they're learning that as they go along. But you created a possibility for them. They probably think that's a regular occurrence at NYU, but it isn't. But I would be curious from an undergraduate perspective, because a lot of the organization of the university is motivated by undergraduates, um, which are at NYU directly attached to tuition. That's why the, some of these disciplines and departments exist in a certain way, if that makes any sense. But it's just to how that opening up that happened that Brian just talked about, how that happened for everybody and for Brian and Vita as well in your departments, how how you actually talked, how you would talk about your experience in your own home departments 
whether this project fits into the confines or scope of that of those departments. I, I could say something to that real quick. Um, I don't know. Um, well, you're in my department, Willie, so <laughs> I have to be careful there, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, it doesn't it doesn't fit in i mean uh, uh there's a lot of media theory that's come out of germany right so i can i can kind of say you know this is new german media theory that i'm doing or whatever right but um we have some trouble in literature uh working in the present i think sometimes um and you know the the media conditions of the present are a topic that we leave to mcc sometimes and i think that in order to really capture things in the culture of the present, whether they are literary phenomena or not, any kind of aesthetic phenomena, whatever we might be doing, that this kind of work is, is actually necessary. So I'm, I'm hoping that it loops back around in a certain way. Um, but I do think it's interdisciplinary. When I, hear, when I hear you say that, Ryan, I feel really optimistic for you <laughs> because I think that uh, 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 the, the things that restrain us from doing that kind of work also kind of have a you know they have a deleterious effect so i think you know that you will come across singular also on the job market when you when you get out there and then i just want to say that that when i taught the digital theory seminar which was so much fun to do for undergraduates i can't speak for all the undergraduates first of all i recruited a couple of them to come into the lab one of them does come to the lab and she's applying for phd's now so for better or for worse i you know corrupted the youth and made an academic out of someone no she was already on the track but i think that uh you know, there was a moment there where we were really studying Turing and one of the kids said, this is really hard, but I think I see something now about digital technologies that I didn't see before. And I said, well, what do you, what are, how do you usually think about it? Or like, what would, why wouldn't, you know? And I said, well, we, there's a lot of kind of like, how do you feel about social media? And, and so by, by doing something other than that, by taking the, the, the theory seriously the, and the computation seriously, I felt like we really achieved something in that class for, for whatever that's worth. I mean, I would say on the undergraduate side, um, one of the, so one of the things that always distinguishes knowledge in the humanities, right, is that it's situated in people's personal experiences inflect so much the way that they approach these questions. And I was just talking to like guest lecturing in Zabilda's class on Monday about some of the stuff that we had done in the lab. And one of the things which is often so interesting about talking about this stuff in a Spanish department setting is that so many of the students um, have undocumented family members or DACA themselves or have a variety of different interactions with these bureaucracies that are approaching that they're approaching not from an academic setting but from some kind of a um, an activist setting or a political setting we had one undergraduate in our in our undergraduate class actually like lead the discussion in one of the um, in one of the in one of the meetings of the undergraduate class because she was writing her thesis on the legal status of climate migrants which is a which are people who are not covered by any form of asylum treaty because the climate is is under the geneva convention not something which can discriminate against you um so everybody who was displaced by global warming is not covered by any of these things so we were able to have an undergraduate who knew about that stuff and who was especially concerned about that stuff um lead our discussions in it and the thing that that Brian did in the undergraduate class that I learned so much from watching and that then uh, shaped a lot about the way that I framed some of the assi the assignments in a in a non asylum class that I taught uh, last fall for undergraduates was to find ways to use these sorts of sources to directly involve undergraduates in primary source research research and writing original content not like as a as a exercise paper just to see what they can do which then gets shelved and never seen again but to think about how they can write something for the web that we can share that uh tells a useful story about some of these people that doesn't necessarily require being fully steeped in all of the the disciplinary lore that those of us in humanities classes have so one of the papers that brian supervised i assigned to zabilla's class um because it was on brian's website i could send it in and it made a really useful point about 
uh, the way that Chinese migrants had their status normalized in the 1950s while being like deeply rooted in these sources in a way that captured the life of this one petty criminal who got off a boat and kicked around San Francisco for 30 years before getting normalized. Brian's nodding because he remembers that guy. That was our favorite guy, right, George Lee? Um, so yeah, I mean, having in, in what they did in Brian's class was a lot of the work. I don't know, Brian, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about Elijah and Emma and, and, and the relationship that you've had with them over the course of this. Yeah, I, definitely. Um, now I'm paranoid. My microphone isn't working again. Is it, are you hearing me? So it's okay, great. <laughs> so the the I think it's first of all interesting enough that you know the structure in terms of the the faculty and the uh, graduate students who were teaching this class were mostly historians. Not all of us. Uh, yet none of our students were. So all of our undergraduate students were coming from different disciplines. Um, and that was the, it was the asylum title in the class that drew them in, right? It was the, the concept of the class and it wasn't because it was a, a history class or whatever that was. And it just happened that if you weren't, we decided basically, if you weren't in the Spanish Portuguese department um, and you were in any other category uh, or other or department, you would then be in this history practicum. Um, and, and you know, it really kind of showed me that it, you could reach across like in this way, which I understand, you know, undergraduates are taking a lot of different stuff and aren't as siloed as graduate students. Um, but a lot of these undergrads really were able to find pretty amazing connections to this material, I think really because it wasn't filtered through secondary literature, but we were just giving them the raw stuff to work with and put their, you know, really sink their teeth into it. And, and they did. And we weren't sure how it was going to go. And we weren't sure if they were going to be able to kind of sift through thousands of pages of documents and do archival research like a historian would do, but they did. And, and not only that, but they were, the thing that still stands out to me is how excited they were about arguing over the metadata. Like I thought that was going to be tooth pulling exercise to get these undergrads to care about whether or not we put gender in our classification schema or not. And you know, the, we, the, the debates went on and on. So it was, it was invigorating for many of them um, so much to the point that two of them did want to keep working on the project, um, one of whom volunteered. We couldn't hire her. And she said, I'm going to keep working on this, whether you let me or not, basically, whether you pay me or not, I'm just going to keep doing it. And I tried to dissuade her, but <laughs> she kept going. Um, and so much that she was, uh, she's a philosophy major, was planning on going into corporate law and was eyeing all of these law programs to do corporate law of some kind or international business law. But by the end of our class um, had fully committed to becoming an immigration histor uh, immigration lawyer. And that's what she's, she's applying to do right now. So, um, you know, th there was a pretty remarkable kind of, you know, I think this, someone made the, the comment about, uh, you know, kind of, pulling somebody into the dark side of academia or whatever, I, I feel I achieved something of the same thing, hopefully, um, and getting somebody to be interested in it being an immigration lawyer too. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was an interesting way because we learned from the undergraduates almost as much as I think they learned from us. And, and it went, it, you know, it went from graduate student to them, to the, to the professors as well. So it was kind of, um, you know, everybody was benefiting in different ways in this kind of unusual setup. Um, and, you know, it was pretty common that our students would also remark on the fact that the, this class structure was nothing like they'd ever experienced and was, was very unusual, but was to them um, one of the best undergraduate classes they'd taken. Not, and this is not to just kind of toot our own horns here, but they, they really, I think, thrived in this kind of unusual setup that we were able to, to, to create because of the, the collaborative scale and, uh, of it all. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Zibilla also weighed in on the chat and said she couldn't have done the work in her class and be responsive to our student body without your lab, actually, how to do this. I, I was trying to connect this to something Beto said earlier, and you all said about the ethics of uh, using documents uh, about people who who have lived and maybe spent their families still live here. And so I'm curious how you do this with undergraduates and yourselves when you're producing work. You have to teach them a lot of things you don't really know. And I think I've heard this a couple of times, you've learned so much, but you're not total. Then there's a little bit of an area that I would be curious how you manage that. So you're putting things up. Uh, these people, some, many of them have descendants, they have families, they are traceable in a way. So how do you actually teach students at the same time? What is a, how do we deal with this kind of um, responsibility as scholars 
and Vita, maybe you can weigh in because you brought that up. I found that really important and interesting to, to think about. Yeah, unfortunately, I joined um, the lab after the practicum, practicums had been held. So I, I didn't get to, to work with the undergraduate students. Um, but I, I mean, I think I would try to address it rather frankly with them, right? Like these, <laughs> uh, I mean, and that's why I try to end with that question, right? Like, it, I, I think there is tremendous value in approaching these documents in, in the way that I think, um, like, Ben is principally interested, right? And I think there, there's utility, not just for like the digital humanists in, in terms of seeing like what you can um, derive from like a critical mass of these documents, but I think things that advocates could do with them, right? But like, I think there is a need to also keep a lot of this information anonymous. Um, and so I, I, I think I would, you know, tell them that for until we can uh, better resolve some of these questions, this is an exercise that we're gonna contain to the classroom, right? Um, and, you know, try to be conscious and reflective of the fact that like, you know, these people are not reducible to the categories um, that these government documents, you know, clearly um, force upon them. And from what I like hear from Brian, it seems like that was a huge part of, for instance, the metadata exercise, right, is like, um, we're both looking at the categories that the government has used to essentially order these people and make them legible, but also like trying to think of more capacious, more inclusive ones. Um, but it's it's a definite challenge. And I think our the workshop we convened where we brought together some, you know, attorneys, advocates, really I think brought that home, right? Like we're we're thinking about this in, in two pretty distinct ways. Um, one which again leads people who have sympathetic um, or sympathy and interest for this, these communities to, to feel that, you know, often destroying these documents is a safer bet, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big question. And I think one that the lab in its sort of future um, incarnation will have to definitely grapple with, right? I think that's gonna be huge to actually like building trust with different immigrant communities, um, given as I sort of, that, like the very understandable distrust that exists currently between um, them and anyone they perceive to be a kind of representative of the government or its institution. So yeah, not much of an answer, but <laughs> just keep thinking, I guess, is what. Yeah, it's really cool. And, and then, sorry, sorry, what Ben also said earlier, and I, I kind of would like all of you to weigh in on this sort of the future iterations you brought you all said you brought in lots of people that maybe wouldn't have been your standard lineup in a regular academic course and you talked about Ben talked about what what kind of funding are you looking for what do you think comes out of this uh leave and ryan to like you have so many international collaborations you've produced you know academic output you know peter has done like this and another kind of output the kind of interventions, activist work. So where do you think this goes? And partly we're really listening, Molly and I really sort of, so it doesn't just fall off. You got your Polanski grant, you're done, see you later. We don't ever hear from you. Like, how do we actually learn um, with this, with an eye that, like, I have no power to do any of this, but instead of how an eye, how is the university uh, going to keep on accommodating these things so they don't sort of fade away, you know? And, Ryan's done a great job and either be here or leave us or Peter and Brian are either going to get so how do we actually make that into something that sort of bleeds out into the community in a good way. Do, do you want us to start or I'm, I mean, the, Ben, do you want to say something? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, the word, I'm, I've been actively thinking about this every semester since, since, since the first year. And I would think to myself, well, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe this is it, but it never was. And it, so far it never has been. And, and, and I've just come to trust the group. The group is really, really solid, but you're right. We'll lose Ryan because Ryan is going to go somewhere else with his, with his singular PhD project, you know, and, and in, in probably just a year or two. And um, yeah, I'm having some meetings next week with students in current classes, and I'm trying to, I, I have been sort of thinking about how, how do you sort of creatively keep teaching in this vein? Because like you said, it doesn't necessarily fit directly into any given department. So um, um, I've, I've been collaborating with, with different places um, on, on, on how, to, how, to sort of, how to sort of do that. 
And I think that, I mean, I think it has to, it has to remain at that, at that undergraduate level as well. Um, it has to be, it has to be something that, that we continue to offer. One of the things that I think we need to think about and, uh, is, is the six credit course format because the six credit course format in which I offered the digital theory seminar the first time was incredible. I mean, it was a lot of work and in order to do it, even though I, you know, went to all of the lab sessions on the Fridays, like I taught the whole six, but I also had and hired using the funds, uh, a TA. And even so it was, a, it was a ton of work and whatever, but this is something where I think that the institution needs to be more flexible about the, uh, you know, how we assign those credits and how we do that, because at least for us, and at least for the way that I designed that course, like we needed to do exactly what the lab does, which is to look at the stuff together. And the seminar sessions tended to be, we read, we read closely, we read carefully, we think conceptually, whatever, but those lab sessions were the time where we were tinkering and where they were actually like opening the terminal on the computer and actually like thinking about, okay, how does this Frege text actually make sense with code when I actually put some, you know, code on a line and I see an effect occur on the screen or whatever. So for me, theory has to be practical in that way. That's been the guiding insight of the lab from the beginning. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that we, that we need to be able to do. So I think sort of, we're, the labs for me, at least our lab, is like very light on its feet. It doesn't need to have a huge institutional footprint the way that the Humanities Center so wonderfully does, but it does need to have just like enough enough of a foothold that those types of things are, are flexible. You have the flexibility to teach undergrads, to recruit people from the graduate population to continue to be in the lab, and then to do the organizational work, which is pretty significant to run what now has become a, at least always two part, you know, thing that's happening here. And then also on the zoom and international space. So I, I'm in the process of realizing those things. Um, but, but, uh, but so far it's been the organic energy of the lab itself that's kept it going for, you know, quite a few years. How about from the asylum lab? How do you see this um, going forward? So, as I mentioned, I think for us, we always saw what Brian was doing, that website that he built as being a prototype of what would it look like to build something um, really expansive to deal with the, I don't know if it's the full number of A files that have come in, but like various different ways of working with the real machinery of the, of the immigration state, the documentation produced by it that can allow forms of access to it that aren't just by USCIS, uh, which is who it's built for, and to a lesser degree for genealogists, which are the only group that ever manages to successfully uh, lobby the, the federal government to change its policies. Um, so I think for us, one of the things that will keep us going here is if we um, is if we figure out a way to structure a grant from somewhere that will help us to um, to build out larger portals, looking at some of the same sorts of documents that we've been looking at so far, finding ways to mobilize. Uh, communities around uh, gathering the stories from their own individual areas. And so that's where we've sort of been moving recently. Uh, we gave this presentation at the history department last month, and that led us to talk to a number of the people with really specific subject area uh, expertise. And this is these, well, to start talking to them. And we're having those conversations over the next couple of months. But like um, Ada Ferrer, who's done a lot of work on her own family who emigrated from Cuba, had this big New Yorker article about it a few years ago. I mean, Ada like, saw her talk and was like, oh, geez, I got to request the A files of all of these people. And so um, one of the things that university groups do so well is they generate expertise. So we're able to be, tell Ada like, well, this is exactly what you need to do. These are the steps that we're going to go through. And we're going to start figuring out like, what would it look like with her to help people who are interested in telling interlocked family stories what resources do those sorts of people need in order to navigate this really opaque um, bureaucracy for FOIAing documents and for determining which stuff is stored in which caves at NARA, what stuff is hard to find and what stuff has actually been destroyed. Um, and we've been talk talking to Irving, uh, Irvin, 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 I don't know how to say Irvin's last name. <laughs> um, I think it's Ibargun, yeah. But yeah, as the mission of this thing shifts in various ways, that means figuring out how to bring 
new people on with discrete projects that can make use of the expertise that's that's grown over time. Um, in our case, like we had some initial conversations with um, with people at Tandon and at the Center for Data Science when we thought we were going to be looking at a, at a completely different data set, and we were just talking today in our in our regular weekly meeting about um, what it would mean to to reignite having data science students working on this stuff, not from the databases that we were looking at when we began, but from all of these digitized images that we're looking at now. Um, flippantly, I'd also say it's always been a dream of mine to sue the federal government, and I see some interesting routes to doing that with these things. There's a lot of stuff that's not being released. I don't know uh, at what point we uh, we get into that. I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that we can find a way more seriously to talk to um, some of the public advocacy groups that we've developed relationships with through the course of this, especially this reclaim the record groups uh, that that just like sues uh, over FOIA issues left and right. Um, and that has led to some other interesting collaboration that talked to Alec about the 1950 census too. Um, but the core of that for us is this expertise in handling this particular type of record and all of the really mundane technical ways that it takes, which as Brian alluded to, has kept these from being resources that are used even by immigration historians. Um, and finding the appropriate channels to disseminate that. Uh, Brian's also been talking about doing that with the um, Immigration History Society too, like organizing sessions and panels to get those groups doing it, is a way of like reproducing the knowledge that we've gained and also of, um, I mean, to, to, to talk more like uh, strategically or whatever, like it's, uh, it, it, like it builds up NYU as a status, as a place where people know how to do this kind of stuff, which is pretty uh, narrowly distributed. And it means that all of the various different constituencies that we've talked to will refer people back to us when they're talking about us types of questions. Uh, Ryan and Brian, would you anything to add or? Uh... Um, maybe just one kind of linking uh, idea that brings back something you'd asked earlier as well about the kind of ethical issues involved in that too, and that we, in going forward, are kind of constantly plagued by wondering what's, you know, what do we have to really be careful about doing though at the same time? And so our, our future iterations are deeply kind of connected to the, a lot of those initial questions that we had and about, you know, what what is safe what is ethical and what what is the right thing to do that's not just completely extracted for the sake of researchers um and it, it, there was a point made about how do you teach those kinds of things to the undergrads and you know really i was pretty we we of course built a lot of this into our teaching and we had whole you know classes where we we examined questions about this in terms of digital public history and so on and, and hosting collections that are available to people but it was actually um i i found this our undergraduates were even more um, adverse to to hosting things, and, and they were they were the most sort of um, concerned about what we were doing so much to the extent that one of my undergraduates wrote her final exhibition about how essentially what we were doing was really dangerous and, and maybe the wrong thing to do altogether. So she was kind of taking apart the whole system uh, as we went, which was really helpful. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Ben's points are all really important and really what we're looking at, but um, it is it's amazing, astounding actually how few immigration historians do use these documents that we are looking at in particular. And um, it's not to say that it's not fraught with difficulty and, and ethical issues and whatever we might do that has a public facing side to it as well. Um, but that's where this collaboration really works because um, a lot of red flags that come up for certain um, disciplines don't come up in others. And so that's, it's been really key. Uh, and maybe I'll, I would just add, uh, uh, just as a general thing to what Leif was saying, um, thinking about like future solutions to housing or uh, continuing sustaining the kind of work we've done. It, it the way I would, I, I don't have a simple answer, but it's kind of a nice, uh, luxurious problem to have because it does feel a little bit like, uh, for me personally, on the you know precipice of doing a dissertation, job market stuff, trying to think about what would I do with this? How would I explain it to people? Um, all of that, it, they feel like good 
luxurious problems to have because it feels a bit like an interregna, like I'm straddling a bit of an interregnum between an old form of doing stuff and an, possibly a new form or something like that. Um, I don't have I don't have answers to any of that right now. It, it, it's kind of a, a task to figure all of that out in my own stuff and with and with the lab. Um, and I wish we could hire Ryan as a postdoc. <laughs> give that that kind of footprint where we could send him out into the world, you know, from the position of having, you know, partially run the lab or something like that, you know. But that that you know is I again it's like you know those are the types of things one could do if one were in you know but but uh, but again the lab is pretty light on its feet so. Yeah. I mean I, I find myself in the best position like. Uh, so much information. I feel like I listen to like how an entire college could be set up <laughs> in the 21st century. So that's really great. So I, I just want to thank you for um, having been so super active and and designing this all for what works for you, for your students, and for your colleagues. I think that's really great. That's what the point of this is. That actually there's no blueprint, no template, no paradigm. That actually this is allowing people to do what what work that people had not imagined actually is possible to do. So that's the, that's that's for us, just being in this administrative role, really the greatest thing to see that and to hear from you. So I really want to thank all of you. Um, it also sounds like you had a lot of fun. And uh, one thing that NYU really tries to do a lot and isn't always so great about uh, for people to meet each other or who have shared interests and didn't even know that part. That's also part of the function of what the center is for um for you to get to know one another so and we really appreciate you taking the time to share that all of this experience uh with other people as i've said and the bill uh, fisher who was part of this today i want to thank her also for weighing in that's really helpful we'll take that into consideration how departments schools have to constantly also be made aware that this is happening exists that's part of our job in the center that people actually realize what you're all doing um to find ways to locate and anchor it elsewhere so I want to thank all of you um, for participating. Uh, we may draw on you yet again for your expertise and knowledge uh, when we have new groups coming in, because every group really learns from this and, and you know, they'll invent new ways of doing it. So we really appreciate that. Um, and I want to thank Molly and Kyla for setting this up. And um, uh, you all sound busy, actually. When I listen to you, all of you, how many times do you meet? <laughs> I kind of think, wow, that's very impressive and that's great. And um, as I said, like everybody says on Zoom, that um, we do hope that very, very soon we will be able to do this in person. So, uh, uh, thank, thank you so much you for having us. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, congratulations for these great projects. Really exciting to hear all this.